Hey everyone, my name is Jorge Brea, founder and president of Symphonic Distribution. And I'm Jeanette Barrios, director of marketing for Symphonic. Using Fader Pro, you've got amazing courses at your fingertips, aimed at helping you excel in your production, as well as getting insight from some of the world's top producers. Our course will discuss what you can do after your track has been completed. We will also be discussing how distribution works, marketing and promotion, how to make money in the music industry, and mistakes to avoid, and much more. Throughout the course, you will get suggestions and feedback for success based on the many years of running Symphonic Distribution. But first, let's discuss a little bit more about us. Symphonic Distribution was founded in late 2006. As a producer and DJ, I was focused on working hard on new productions and also getting them released on record labels through vinyl or CD. However, I was also interested in creating my own path through the industry. I had a challenge though, and that was that unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of available income to be able to press my own CDs and vinyl. With the industry going through an evolution from physical to digital, I, like many, started to see a trend that digital was probably going to be here to stay. I decided to create my own digital record label to release my music, as well as music of other artists out in the world. After some success, I started to realize that I could help other record labels and producers in the same position as myself, and out of that, Symphonic Distribution was born. Since the launch of the company, we focused on digital distribution as our core business, delivering music to many record labels and artists to Beatport, Traxor, Spotify, and hundreds more. We've also expanded the company through other music-based services and all of it through the years of hard work and strategic moves. We have a full team of support on hand that can work with our clients and assist them through our various services that we offer, like mastering, creative design, anti-piracy, and much more. We now distribute over 7,000 record labels, 15,000 artists, and have delivered songs from Dead Mouse, Cascade, Dasik, Bass Nectar, and many new and established artists as well. The company was launched because I had a similar need that record labels and artists currently still have. To be able to get music out there, make revenue from it, and all the while, not spend a lot of money. Our mission is to help our clients feel empowered and also learn as much as possible along the way. This is why we're doing this course with Fader Pro. Sharing the same mentality to help artists through unique and creative ways, we wanted to take the time out to also educate as much as possible on some important parts of the music industry aside of making music. So, let's get on to it. So now that you've met Jeanette, myself, and Symphonic Distribution, let's get into it. So what exactly is digital distribution? Digital distribution is essentially the delivery of media content such as audio, video, software, and video games. When you went to the record store as a kid, or even when you buy any product at a store of any kind, chances are it's coming from a distribution company of some kind. Digital distribution is very similar to this, in that one company delivers potentially your product and thousands of other products from many other creators out there in the world. The obvious difference between digital and physical distribution is that there is no product that you hold in your hand. It is all software based. Before we dive a little bit deeper into digital distribution, let's talk a little bit about how digital distribution came about and where we are today. Over the past decade, the digital distribution aspect of the music industry has grown tremendously. A lot of people point to the late 90s and early 2000s as to when digital was born and it's certainly a time frame that I also agree with. In case you may have been too young to remember, which is a possibility nowadays, a startup by the name of Napster changed the industry forever. The service, which launched on June 1st, 1999, soon spread like a virus, infecting every music fan with a computer and a dial-up connection. By March of 2000, Napster had 20 million users, and several months later, it was more than three times that. By then, the company and its wonderkind creators had been targeted by the RIAA, or the Recording Industry Association of America and its suite of attorneys, along with several global superstars like Metallica and Dr. Dre. To the music labels, Napster were completely upending a system that had been in place for decades, toying with a very carefully crafted mechanism that allowed the artist, the manager, and any single middleman a certain percentage of each record sold. To the musicians, the Napster co-founders were outright thieves, providing an avenue to steal music without paying a dime for it. Depending on what side of the aisle you fell on, if you worked in the industry or if you were just a regular old music fan, Napster were either the villains or the heroes. Of course, the dream didn't last. 
Due to the RIAA's lawsuit, Napster ended up shutting down in July 2001, its creators eventually forced to pay millions of dollars to artists and copyright holders. Since then, Napster has gone through several iterations, and the service still exists today, however it's a shell of its former self. It is now a part of Rhapsody. By late 2002, the file sharing service that had peaked at 80 million users was no longer in business, and the Recording Industry Association of America had sued the company successfully for copyright infringement, forcing Napster to shut down. But the power of Napster would love on for years afterward as a more sophisticated, harder to kill copycats from Kazaa to LimeWire to BitTorrent began to take its place. The world's biggest record labels, fearing the power these services gave to consumers, did everything they could to virtually lock CDs and online music files, using watermarks and other digital rights management so they would spread like free MP3s. Enter Steve Jobs. Steve, Apple's founder and chief executive, saw Napster, MP3s, and the internet in a whole different way. By late 2002, he believed music fans clearly wanted to download songs they liked in an affordable and easy way rather than driving to Tower or Best Buy or some other record store to buy them for $15 to $18 CDs. But during this period, the record industry had no affordable, easy, and legal option allowing this to happen. Jobs saw an opportunity. He began to contact executives at the major record labels, some of whom were arriving at the same conclusion. Music downloading could be piracy, sure, but it was also impossible to ignore, and it was a crucial new way of doing business. He began with Warner Music, home of Neil Young, R.E.M., and Linkin Park, and wound up on the phone with Paul Vittich, a vice president. By this point, Apple had already hatched the iTunes Music Store and synced it perfectly with a piece of hardware that begged for the content. What was that hardware? The iPod, of course. The iTunes Music Store opened up on April 28, 2003, and it was an instant revolution. CDs had been available for more than 20 years, but consumers had been demonstrating since Napster's 1999 debut that they were ready for a format change. The iPod suddenly had incredible power, and its white earbuds looked perfect in the silhouette ads. Apple spent millions of dollars putting on TV and billboards. This was the moment digital music was no longer for thieves and miscreants. It was cool for people. The RIAA would begin suing its customers later that year for copyright infringement, but that's a whole other story. Today, iTunes has sold billions of dollars worldwide and continues to be the leader of the digital music industry. But let's not forget the leader of the electronic dance music retail scene, of which many credit to be Beatport. Similar to iTunes, Beatport launched in 2004, right around the time the music industry was becoming very receptive of digital, being a new form of income for music. What they did was quite phenomenal. They brought the DJ-minded record store to the internet and allowed anyone to buy exclusive music cheaper than ever before. Starting out with only 79 record labels, the site continues to redefine itself and is probably one that you're quite familiar with. A few of the tips that I always like to share, you know, with some of the some of the platforms out there, is number one, um, with Facebook, Facebook, first of all, just have fun with it, you know, and again, learn all the tools and how to tag correctly and just best practices, you know, within the social media platform so you can engage a little bit better with your fans. I would also recommend to pay attention to to the tabs. Um, there, it's basically a feature that's allowed on Facebook that you can integrate with, let's say, like SoundCloud. Put tour information in there. You can also integrate your newsletter subscriptions in there as well, because you typically just want to basically funnel all the traffic that you're getting into Facebook, so that it can allow for people to visit and get to know a little bit more about you or find out what's going on. Now that you've gotten some feedback regarding what digital distribution is, marketing and promotion, let's talk about how you actually make money through distribution and other areas of the music industry. There are actually many ways to monetize your experience in music, but we'll discuss some of the main ones that have been fruitful for our clients, as well as those that are easiest to understand and of course, the easiest for you to gain some revenue. As you know, there are streaming providers and then there are download stores. Both are different in terms of how music is received by a consumer. Typically, Download stores will sell for anywhere from $0.99 cents to $1.29 per song. After the retailer covers all of their costs through any merchant fees or any other fees that may be subjected due to the selling of their content in particular territories, they will then split what is left with the supplier of the song. 
The supplier ends up being either the digital distributor, a record label, and or an artist, if they have conformed to the delivery specifications. Every retailer and supplier has a unique relationship, but typical industry standard splits would mean that the supplier is potentially making 60% of the total sale after all fees with the retailer keeping 40%. A digital distributor, they'll typically keep about 10 to 15% of the 60% paid, meaning that as a label or direct artist, you'd receive anywhere from 45 to 50% net. Digital distributors like ourselves have percentage-based offerings to cover a number of different things, hosting, bandwidth, employee salaries, marketing, and much more. At the end of the day, walking away with 45% to 50% is quite favorable, especially if you have a hit record. Streaming is a little bit different than downloads, and we'll take a look at Spotify to be specific. Their model is somewhat similar to other providers, but since each works differently, we want to focus on more general streaming-related revenue descriptions. For Spotify, to make you as an artist or record label, they obviously need to make money too. Spotify has two tiers, a free tier and a premium subscription tier. Spotify's total revenue comprises money received from advertising on the free tier, and subscription payments on the premium tier, and that's when the payments begin to occur. Spotify pays royalties for all the listening that occurs on their service by distributing nearly 70% of all of the revenue that they receive back to rights holders. By rights holders, I'm referring to labels, distributors, independent artists, etc. So how does this work? That 70% is split amongst the holders in accordance with the popularity of their music on the service. The label or publisher divides these royalties and accounts independently to each artist depending on the deal they have. Every time somebody listens to a song, it generates a payment, but it's not a fixed per play rate. Although much public discussion at Spotify has speculated about such a rate, their payouts for individual artists have grown tremendously over time, and as a result of their user growth, they continue to do so. This trend has continued to happen across the entire industry from a streaming perspective. The more subscribers, the more revenue. An artist's royalty payments depend on the following variables, among others, in which country people are streaming an artist's music, Spotify's number of paid users as a percentage of total users, higher percentage paid, higher per stream rate, relative premium pricing, and currency value in different countries. Many record labels and artists ask us, how much can you make off Spotify? Recently, variables have led to an average per stream payout to rights holders between 0.006 and 0.0084. Obviously, we expect these rates to continue to increase the more subscribers and successes these streaming providers actually do have. As you can see, getting an actual number per play is also nearly impossible, but you can expect any number around these rates and up, especially as the years go by. With that, a distributor will retain a percentage, and then the rest is paid out to you. This means that you may see a lot of numbers under $1 in your statement, but with more plays and more success on the way, hopefully these rates will continue to eclipse the decreasing download market. Collaboration with other producers is great, especially record labels, because you know if you tie yourself down to one particular brand, you're potentially limiting any new opportunities. Uh, you know, a lot of producers, when they're first starting out, think that it's just getting signed to a major record label or to one record label, but Spreading yourself out there and even kind of crossing genres is something that I definitely recommend, you know, for a lot of people to do when they're first starting out and even some established ones. I mean, you've seen Dead Mouse do various things on various labels. You've seen a lot of artists that start to cross collaborate with each other and they get into different genres. So I definitely recommend that that's a positive thing for anybody that uh, is looking to get their name out.